I am fortunate that I somehow have the talent or the misfortune to stumble on the right topic at the right time when enough people are about to get angry about it. Um, I was lucky to stumble on the issue of climate change and technology transfer when it became a big deal in the climate change negotiations. And on this issue in particular, I've been lucky that just three weeks ago, a pharmaceutical company in the US, Alvin, transferred all of his patents to the Restasis eye droid to this egregious Mohawk Indian tribe. And then in that agreement, agreed to license that back, the tribe agreed to license that back to the company. So how would the company do that? And we're presuming it's not out of the goodness of their heart, because Algin had them, definitely does not have that reputation. And so the thing that they are trying to escape is the fact that those patents are being challenged or are about to be challenged and the ability is about to be challenged in the post-grant review phase that was established in the U.S. under the um, Interparts Review Process under the American In Invents Act. And so they've realized that if they transfer this to the tribe, the tribe can claim, they argue, sovereign immunity from the U.S. Patent Office's administrative processes such that they would be protected from the process of invalidation that might occur in that process. So, as you can imagine, I, I'm on a bunch of intellectual property professor listservs. Let's just put it this way. I had to turn off my phone because we're getting updates every two to three seconds. People being like, what, 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 what? They can do this? And it turns out, intellectual property professors know nothing about Indian law or Native American tribal codes. And so people spend years, like days and days scrambling, and it turns out that over the past two years, I had been doing a project <laughs> trying to figure out what Native American tribes were doing um, on intellectual property. And so it turns out my work is oddly timely. But it turns out I'm not actually interested in the core question of sovereign immunity. So, by way of introduction, why on earth is an African, and I'm a South African, uh, from Johannesburg, from Soweto, doing, studying the protection of intellectual property and traditional knowledge in the U.S. of Native American tribes, and particularly looking at tribal codes? What is the connection? And so for me, the connection comes from work I've been doing over the past 10 years related to the international processes and the international negotiations for instruments to provide protection for traditional knowledge and traditional, traditional cultural expressions and folklore. So WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, if one wishes to be cynical about the organization, and I am not necessarily cynic, but one could say this. Many, many years went by, and they found it very, very difficult to find a way to create new substantive norms and treaties that they could bring into the organization. It had been decades since the last substantive patent law agreement. They barely got the White Book Copyright Treaty through, the White Book Performance and Photogram Treaty. Norm setting had come to a halt, and they needed a new constituency, a new constituency of right holders. So WIPO went out and sought to talk to indigenous groups and I think very clearly also minority groups in Africa, in Asia, in Australia, and found a constituency and perhaps one would argue that created, they would, some people would argue, a constituency for an international instrument to protect the traditional knowledge and the traditional cultural expressions of indigenous and, as they say, traditional local communities. Now, the other side of the argument is saying, well, it didn't create the constituency. The constituency came to them. So why would indigenous and local communities come to the World Intellectual Property Organization and say, you need to help us? And the problem that we're encountering is 
precisely the problem that I'm trying to talk about, which is indigenous communities identified two primary weaknesses in the intellectual property system, both at the national level and at the international level. First, that the knowledge which was valuable and being created within these communities was not protectable under traditional intellectual property rules. Patents have to be novel and inventive. There has to be some artificial process and an identifiable inventor. And the process of patenting tended to exclude technologies, modes of knowing and modes of knowledge that traditional communities engaged in. Same thing with copyright, the requirement of originality, identification of an original author at a particular point in time, also resulted in a lack of protection. So that was one argument. But the bigger part of the argument was really the misappropriation. Here, the issue of outsiders, people who do not belong to the communities, coming into the communities, mining the communities for knowledge, both for traditional knowledge as it relates to plants, medicines, other technologies, but also for cultural knowledge, dances, songs, right? The modern thirst for authenticity right, drives artists from the West, from Europe, from America, to go to these places to find authentic, they say, authentic music, authentic experiences, authentic dances to then import right, and use and hybridize. And that occurred without permission, many times without appropriate and particular respect for the tradition that was engaged, that, that was engaged in the generation and the transmission of that knowledge. And so this misappropriation was a primary factor in why many of these groups reached out to the World Intellectual Public Organization for help. And so you go to an intellectual property organization and you say, please help me. We are having a problem with appropriation. To which the intellectual property organization says, oh, we can help you. What will we do? We will provide you with an intellectual property protection system. And it's an automatic sort of response, right? They have a limited pool of skills. They know how to do one thing. And they say to a man with a hammer, right, everything looks like a nail. So in this case, right, the WIPO, right, the problem here, looked like it was an intellectual property problem. And you can solve it by creating an intellectual property treaty. So, I came into this discussion and argument in 2004 at what I would have been the Intergovernmental Committee on Traditional Knowledge at WIPO, which had already been going for 10 years at that point. So, you can imagine, by 2004, there had been 10 years of negotiations. We still don't have an international instrument for the protection of traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. Right now, the White Coat General Assembly is meeting to discuss whether they should take whatever text is on the table and turn that into a negotiating instrument that might eventually lead to a diplomatic conference in the next two years. I predict with and I'm willing to bet some non-insignificant non amount of money that that will not happen. Right? Why has that not happened? Why have there been, right, in the well, past 20, 23 years, little or no progress on the achievement of such an instrument? Well, so part of the blame lies here, Canada. Right? Canada was a really big problem for this for a long time. The idea that there would be an instrument protecting traditional knowledge and that protected the traditional knowledge of the First Nations people separate and placed such an obligation on the Canadian nation, right? there was significant resistance, especially under previous governments than this one, to that prospect. But it wasn't just the Canadians, right, who presented some of these resistance, right? There was also US was also Australia, was also to some extent New Zealand. And who were why? Why? What do those countries all have in common? So 
one of the things they do have in common is they have settler, right, colonial societies with large, living, current, indigenous peoples who, in almost all those places, have a claim to sovereignty that is recognized in various different fashions, or depending if you live in Australia, some maybe not at all, right, but recognized in some fashion. Right? And that one of the big problems that is encountered here at WIPO is that they thought they were dealing with an intellectual property issue. It turns out they were dealing with a sovereignty issue. Right? That if they, were think if they thought they were going to be dealing with just an issue about providing intellectual property protection of some sort for traditional knowledge and the knowledge of indigenous peoples that we vote for, every time they took a step towards the protection, it seemed to implicate broader questions about what are the appropriate rights and claims of these indigenous peoples in the broader constitutional framework. Part of it is a slippery slope argument, right? Which is, well, if you give them this, they must give this, and then this, and then before you know it, we'll have no country because we'll be cut up into all the different right, regional and sub-regional claims of the indigenous peoples, and God, that would be too much of a mess. We don't want to go over there. None of, some of this was helped, but also not helped, to some extent, by the achievement of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which the US has still not recognized. Canada has only recently, finally decided that it would recognize it in full. Again, there's some complication around that. Australia still hasn't fully adopted or recognized it. New Zealand has. And all of these countries present a problem for the achievement of some form of protection for traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions because it implicates so many other things. So the argument is this is a problem. Right? This is a problem. And it's not just a problem for these countries. I present to you the example of my own troubled country, South Africa. Right. So, for those of you who don't quite know some of the history here, the original inhabitants right, of Southern Africa are who we now call the Khoisan. Right. And we recognize those inhabitants as part of the basic cultural heritage of South Africa. People forget that South Africa actually had two waves of settlers. Right? The very first wave were white people. Right? We, were, we came down from right, Eastern Africa, and you, know, you want to go back far enough from parts of Western Africa, right, the Bantu, and we were cattle farmers. Right? We were cattle farmers. You can tell this because my people, the Zulu, have lived on the coast of Zululand for maybe 300, 400 years. Ask me if we fish or go out in boats. We do not, right? <laughs> because we are farmers. We are cattle herders. We are not swimmers and boat people and eaters of fish. Right? But in that process, right, one of the things that happened was both our people, the Zulus and the Kapsas, engaged in campaigns of extermination of the Khoisan. There was also, of course, in the marriage, right? But it is an old story that we know about, right? But it established the Khoisan kingdoms, the, the Zulu kingdoms, and others on land that had, for all intents and purposes, been occupied by the Khoisan. Okay, so, and then of course, right, um, the Dutch showed up, and the British showed up, and engaged in their own campaigns of settler genocide and settler campaigns, and and then the creation of the Republic of South Africa, which became finally and fully independent in 1994, and in our glorious constitution. Our constitution did two things. Because we built our constitution, we hope, after everybody, many other people had done it, had learned some of those lessons, and we said, in this constitution, we will recognize right, 
the nature and the role of traditional communities in the Constitution. They will have a constitutional framework. There will be a house of traditional leaders. Right? We'll provide recognition of customary law, provided it meets within the, co the constitutional framework. But how does South Africa deal with this issue when it shows up at the World Intellectual Property Organization? Do we say that the claims of traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expression devolve and belong to each of the traditional communities, the Zulu, Kosa, the Sutu, the Peri, or do we make a claim that no, in that situation, they belong to the state, the South African state? And it turns out that what has the South African government said? It is in the domain and the sovereignty of the state. We do not recognize the separate sovereignty, even in the constitution, of our separate ethnic, traditional, indigenous groups. We do not specifically recognize the separate sovereignty, in particular, of the Khoisan. Right? And you can see this because one of the very first cases of misappropriation by the Council on Scientific and Industrial Research, the CSIR, South Africa was the misappropriation right, of traditional knowledge from the sun, which then was taken and then licensed to a foreign company without the benefit to the sun, and we had to go through a corrective process to have that recognized. We didn't change the law, it was a moral change. But, right, but the misappropriation of Hudia right, by the CSIR right, was premised precisely on the fact that the Saturn government does not recognize separate sovereignty courts have to determine on their territory what can and cannot be done with the knowledge that they develop. Right? And that is a fundamental challenge of sovereignty. So that means that the problem is really one of jurisdiction. Okay. Who has jurisdiction over this knowledge? Who has jurisdiction over the generation and the management of intellectual property on the territory of the indigenous groups? And who is appropriate and has the responsibility to deal with the cross-border issue? Right? Who does the metropole state negotiate with when they need to think about the recognition of the system of protection by traditional knowledge holders and indigenous groups of their knowledge and managing what happens when that knowledge crosses the border between the metropolitan state and the indigenous, indigenous group, or one set of indigenous peoples and groups and another set. So I think I come at it from a different perspective then, right? So I've just outlined what I think is the problem. What if sovereignty isn't the problem? What if sovereignty is the solution? Because our discussion about sovereignty is built on the premise that to the extent that we think there are no extant or existing systems of protection and concurrent and ongoing systems of protection and claims by indigenous groups to their traditional knowledge. And so, the project I'm working on then really is asking really a basic evidentiary question, which is, what if we're asking the question the wrong way around? We don't ask whether or not sovereignty allowed, what right, the tribes are allowed to do certain things related to the protection of pleasure property and traditional knowledge. Why don't we ask whether they have already been doing so? Why don't we see what they have been doing? and then work from that basis. Because if they have been doing this, then what it allows us to do is to make a claim that, rather than simply presuming that the law and the custom of traditional knowledge communities of business <coughs> groups is preempted by the law of the state in which they work, we then step and say, look, look, we have examples of them actually doing this, of them actually providing such protection. They're already doing this. And there hasn't been a legal challenge to this. And so now we have, and 
magical thing that we hope gets us through much of our common law, we have precedent that we can use right, as a basis for going forward. And so, I'm starting the project in the U.S. because I think the U.S. has the better, one of the best ways to teach us a lesson in, in sort of two directions. So, for Africa, it allows, the U.S. example allows us to think about what it means to exercise your sovereignty in the absence of a, a system of constitutional recognition of your sovereignty. So, in most African countries, there is no system of constitutional recognition of sovereignty of indigenous groups, traditional communities, right? And in the U.S., the only constitutional recognition of, right, Native American tribes is the recognition that Congress has the plenary power to manage the relationship of the United States to the tribes. The primary way that's been used is to preempt state laws that seek to manage relations with the tribes and shift that up to the federal level. But right, the thing that works side by side with that is that it turns out that the Constitution isn't supreme with respect to that relationship. Right? That relationship is also governed by treaties. And I think that's the other side of the lesson that may, that comes into play, that if one looks at the treaties, again, with the caveat that every single one of those treaties, except for maybe the, some of the more recent, have been pretty much ignored, right? broken, massaged beyond recognition right, by the federal government and by the U.S. Supreme Court. Right? But nevertheless, right, because we like to work in our pure legal labs and our pure theoretical legal ideas, but I think there's power here to then look at what Right. What can we say, based on the treaty relationships, that says the tribes have already been doing this, right, and can do it? I cannot take credit for that question, right? That question was brought to me by a colleague of mine, uh, Preston Hardison, who works as a policy analyst for the Tulane tribes out of Washington State. And he what he said, this very question about the treaties. Our treaties don't say anything about intellectual property, he said. I want you to find out for me, because he thought I was a really good lawyer and he was very wrong, because I don't know anything about Indian, I didn't, at the time he asked me, I didn't know anything about Indian law or tribal codes, whether or not the fact that those treaties don't transfer to the federal government ownership, rights, or use over our intellectual property and our British knowledge, that means that we never transfer that. That means we retain, under, our, under the U.S. traditional framework, the right to engage and control and protect and prevent from misappropriation our traditional knowledge and our uh, folklore. So, I'm going to present to you a couple of the results, and then we'll talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that come out of that. But you can imagine that the very prospect of asking this question is terrifying to several people, right? So in the US, the prospect is terrifying in two ways. And I suspect it would have some of the same implications here, which are, wait, if US federal intellectual property law can be preempted, or even worse, is not thought to have any effect on tribal land, does that mean that people who are infringing our intellectual property on tribal land can do so without consequence and access to the federal legal system? To which my argument would be, if the answer is what I think it is, yes. Right? So maybe then you want to be thinking about what to do and how to work on terms of respect and equality and negotiate with the tribes on what intellectual property protection should be on tribal land. The other concern is that if federal law doesn't apply, then what you instead will have is this patchwork right, of multiple kinds of protection right, within the US, none of which will be fully harmonized. And I 
again, that is indeed a likely outcome of the exercise of the regulatory sovereignty by any sovereign. Right? The U.S. has different laws on political property from Ghana, from Albania, right, from China, for a reason. Right? It is an exercise of national sovereignty. So if we recognize that sovereignty is the base on which indigenous groups are regulated in this area, of course there will be different patchworks. So what do you have to do? You then have to negotiate, right, you come back around, an international instrument harmonizes the protection of traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. So, I'm not being sneaky, I think this is where we have to end, end, end back up at, but I think what we need to do is come if we want to get the U.S. and Canada and others to come back around to it, is to really show that the issue of sovereignty can only really be dealt with by an international agreement, rather than international agreement being the thing that is causing sovereignty to be the problem. So, what have we found? Well, there are 567 registered Native American tribes in the um, fortunately, a big chunk of them don't have any rip, tribal codes actually written down. And so I've got a sample of about 100, which includes most of the major ones. And not to our surprise, on a pure legal level, on a pure sort of legal code level, we've only found, of those 100, only nine in any way address the issue of intellectual property, or traditional knowledge, or traditional cultural expression, in the formal, legally expressed, in the code manner. Right? So, of those, what do they do? Well, let's see. Some of them revolve around the issue of trademarks, and in particular this issue of non-tribal people making claims to the creation of tribal art, right, tribal crafts, and claiming them to be Navajo when they are not made by Navajo, claiming them to be Arapaho when they are not Arapaho, claiming them to be Sioux when they are not Sioux, right? And so, one of, the re one of the ways in which at least there is some right, explicit regulation of that is via this kind of element in the tribal code. Of course, the reason it's in there is because there actually is a federal law that was passed, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, providing the power and uh, system at the federal level and then require, and then and, they, and they're saying that the tribes can then go ahead and put together domestic codes on, on that to address this issue of trademark violations related to claims of source of arts and crafts. So you have, there you have what is a, a sort of joint development, both at the tribal level and at the federal level of that kind of protection. But again, that's limited just nine of these. Right? This hasn't actually been taken up and done more than that with the, with, with the rest of the tribes. What else are we seeing? Well, one area where you see at least a couple of the tribes have done is in the area of human research. So, one of the areas that you see the Colorado, in particular, let me see, the Colorado River Indian tribes have a human and cultural research code to deal with the fact that universities like the University of Wisconsin like to do genetic population, right, research genetic population, of genetic populations in the tribes to find dispositions and think about ways to develop, right, um, further medicines. And so that code manages the issues of prior informed consent, benefit sharing that will arise from the research, where you can get samples, what you're supposed to do with the samples, all that process. But again, wealthy ad hoc, only in really fully developed in one tribe and maybe, maybe used by a couple of other tribes in the Dakotas. 
The other thing that you do see is around cultural heritage items, um, graves, artifacts, and things like that. In part, again, this is very similar to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. You see a joint development where the tribes went to the federal government to seek intervention for the protection of sacred artifacts, Native American graves and remains, and the repatriation of those to the tribes. So they got the Native American Graves Repatriation Act, NAGPRA, passed. And so that has been one of the biggest, I think, sort of tools for cultural preservation and pre preservation of cultural heritage, but primarily around artifacts. Right? And what's interesting about NAGPRA is it works on the, on, on the premise that the artifacts belong to the tribe. Right? They belong to the tribe. The remains belong to the tribe, right? Not in museums, right? Museums have to go through and recatalog and find it. And, and if they find something they know belongs to a particular tribe, they have to notify and then make, make arrangements to either return or, if the tribe is willing, share custody in some fashion. <laughs> and again, that's primarily at the federal level. Again, because that's what you need to address the cross-border problem, right? The border between the metropole and the jurisdiction of the tribe. NAGPRA is required to do that. The tribes on their own territory can, of course, enforce the rules as much as they want. But what they have, would not have been able to do was to get a national solution to that problem that NAGPRA does that. So, what lesson would force that to think about this? Well, I think that there is a suggestion here that while there is not a significant amount of activity by the tribes here, I have one anecdote that might help. Late last year, I sat down with the Chief Justice of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee. Who does? Copyright. He is a copyright expert in US copyright law. And he's also one of the leading experts on what is called Indian law, which is the relationship of the tribes to the federal government, but also is an expert in tribal code law of the Cherokee. I asked him, so how come I have never seen you do any research or writing or, or cases around copyright issues and tribal law? And he says to me, I believe that never occurred to me. And I think that reflects two things, right? Which is that intellectual property lived in a silo for so long that, you know, only recently now that we succeeded in taking over the world, does then we realize that intellectual property is a potential, right, asteroid that will destroy everything in its path. So that's one way to think about what we've been doing to the world of law in, in some ways. But I think the other way to think about it is he was correct in the sense that the issue never arose because of two things. If misappropriation occurred, it occurred in ways that were largely invisible or accepted. So, who here knows about the Twilight movies and novels? Right? So, Jacob, right, our, our studly werewolf man, right, is, right, he comes the writer that uses the origin myth, right, of the quiet people, right? and it's become huge and it's become popular. And yet, that origin myth is not for her to have used. Right? She did not have permission. It is not meant to be shared beyond a particular group of people, and yet it's out there. And so, one of the things I think happens is because there's been no remedy at the federal level or at the national level for this kind of misappropriation it never occurred to try that they could nevertheless act locally because the problem seemed to be national. Right? So it never occurred to people that you can start local, generate local provisions, and then work from there. I think the other thing that has that occurred, and, he and this is what he told me, which I think is probably even more powerful, is that 
tribal law operates right, in at two levels. It's positive law in the sense that if the code takes on and writes about the issue, then the code controls. But when the justices apply law in an area where there is no law, they tend to default to federal common law, federal law and federal common law, even though that's not actually required by the practice of tribal code, that's just what they have done. And that is, right? And so they've generated a, a, a body of law, right, that really simply presumes that, and because of that, they left the jurisdiction of these issues to the federal courts, when they could maybe claim that jurisdiction. And I've convinced him that he could indeed claim that jurisdiction, and so I'm looking forward to him making his first decision on this sometime in the next five years. But I think that explains to some extent why this never occurred. Right? So what process do we engage in? Then, right? So part of the process is conscientizing, raising awareness, thinking through what some of the problems are that could be addressed this way. But there's a whole area of research which really is missing from this work that I'm doing and other people are doing, which is that the vast majority of laws that address this within the tribes is customary law. Especially around folklore, it's customary law. And so one of the things to think about, and it's, I think, a much more complicated process, is to think about the ways in which customary law can be codified in ways that will provide notice to outsiders about what they can or cannot do, but maintains the control and the capacity and ability of the tribe, nonetheless, to impose it and work it on their territory. So I have a good 10, 15, 20 year research project, which I hope somebody will fund at some point to do. I think that's a challenge, but I think, as I said, all this, I think, takes us back to the necessity for an international instrument. This is what takes us back to the necessity for an international instrument where both Native American and indigenous groups are participants and determinants of, the, of that outcome and the countries are participants because I think that's the only place where we can solve this problem right, and address the issue that we need to. Thank you. So I think I'm going to really get a chance to talk for as long as you want, and I'm apologizing, but I'm happy to take questions. because we call them a legal person and own, right, and have to pass on such a property. And we see this because, right, this is just one tribe that just got this. They didn't just get it as a tribe, they got it as the corporation, right, that is the same regional corporation, right, right, the tribe. So that is one way to think about that. It's not that new, right, that community ownership isn't new in terms of communal ownership. And then, so the bigger question is, how should such communal ownership be regulated? Well, on the federal level, right, it's like corporation, let's say that they say corporation. On the community level, you could essentially say, well, we recognize the customary law of the community for, its inter for determining its internal rules, right? Freedom of association, the freedom to, to decide how the community works. So, and the thing that we talk about in particular, people talk about this all the time, and, and the U.S. brings it up all the time, which are, what is going to happen 
to the people who want to leave the community? Do they lose their rights to engage with and use the traditional knowledge and official cultural expression? And the, now, of course, to be fair, the U.S. does have some concern about this because it is an immigrant society in many ways that they talk about, and there are people there who, right, who come from the traditional indigenous communities. It's the same objection the U.S. gives about why they don't want to protect geographic indications for the like. But what happened to all the Italian Americans who want to make, right? Uh, Reggiano Pomigiani in the U.S. Right? What happens to all the, the Dutch who want to make their Dutch cheese? What happens to all the, right, the Germans who want to make German beer in the U.S.? Right? Those people should have a right to those cultural heritage. I think part of the argument is that, okay, let's talk about an international instrument for what that is. Hybridization, right, which is really the question, which is, what do we do with people who are at the periphery, who engage in hybridization, who want to belong to both communities? Right? They want to be in the community and therefore be able to use and address the community. They also want to be out of the community and be able to hybridize and engage with the modern world and get copyright and benefit from that. Right? And here's the thing. Nothing comes for free. If you want to be considered to be Zulu and to be authentic, or you wish to be considered Aboriginal and authentic and an artist, right? You have to then do so on the basis of the systems of rules set up by the community. And the community has rules about what can and cannot leave the community, the system, what can and cannot be owned and set up for ownership beyond the, beyond the community, then that's what you comply with if you want the benefit of being part of the community. Right? That's within our understanding our concept of human rights, right? It's not that human rights are absolute. You don't have absolute freedom to move wherever you want to go and do whatever you want to do, right? If you go to a part of the community, there's an, ex there's an expectation that you'll work within <coughs> community standards, community behavior, community culture, right? and the community has the rights to its culture. And yes, you have freedom to move, but if you move, there are things to give up by moving. Right? And if we want to think of it from the terms of sovereignty, right? we're really thinking about citizenship. What are the rights that citizenship gives you? If you wish to be a citizen right, of the Salish peoples, then you abide by the rules of citizenship of being part of the Salish peoples. If you want to then leave and simply go be a citizen of right, somewhere else, then you need to figure out a way to abide by both sets of rules if they allow you with citizenship. Or right, you leave, but then you don't get the benefits of citizenship that you left behind. Now, of course, in effect, without an international agreement or some agreement about what happens to cross-border people, People can just leave and do whatever they want because you can't go and get them, right? But if they come back in your territory, then you can impose sanctions on them, right? But at least as far as I'm concerned, if you work from sovereignty, that provides a basis for dealing with this intra-community exchange, right? Because the thing that we are most concerned about, that I'm concerned about, it, isn't that exchange occurs, that exchange has to happen on equal and respectful terms. Nobody just gets to take and not exchange. Nobody just gets to say, my freedom allows me to take, but I don't allow you to then use a copyright protected work or patent work. Right? It's about what are the terms of the cultural exchange rather than appropriation or misappropriation. I will take more questions. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Oh, no. Did somebody else let them know? Oh, never mind. <laughs> so what about in cases of inspired by, right? So there's, of course, like lots of clothing or art makers or various other, um, um, especially artistic producers, where they do things that are not exactly that traditional community's artwork, but it has a flavor and it's clearly inspired by, mm -hmm. right? And in this case, it might not even be inspired by one. It could be inspired by a general... You know, sort of similarity that it shared. 
what about in these such cases where it's very unclear who they're sharing this with and from? Uh, or, who, or from in particular, yeah. right? the question is the from, right? Why the source? <laughs> and I, I think, I don't think that's a unique question to this issue, right? I think it's a question that is always a question about any kind of infringement. If we, if we work from the beginning that, okay, there is protection, then the question of infringement comes up, right? And so what you're asking is really, if we were going to protect TK, what would be the threshold for infringement? And, right? and, who, determines that? and who determines that, right? And again, right, this is where I, I think sovereignty is actually the solution. Infringement isn't an objective reality. It's a policy choice. Right? Every country figures out for itself what they consider is an appropriate level of use that will not be infringing and the level of use that will be infringing, right? Just like we do with copyright, right? We provide, and depending on how you, jump, you talk about it, fair use is either non-infringement or it's a defense to infringement, right? Um, but we provide variations on exceptions to copyright, right? or limitations to copyright, right? that we say, okay, so far, it doesn't constitute infringement, but this far does. And again, do we have an international instrument that provides agreement for everybody on what infringement and copyright is? No. Right? We have what should be protected, but what is actually infringement is left up to each national government. So in this case, I would say it's exactly the same thing. Right? It would be, what does each sovereign determine for itself on its territory what infringement is? And then if we want to argue about, okay, but what about inspired by or this, and we want to have that argument at the national level or at the international level, then we have a negotiation about where to put that mark. Right? Just like we did with the TRIPS agreement when we decided that compulsory licenses would be limited only in very specific ways, then everybody complies with that. But <coughs> absent such a, an agreement, it's up to each sovereign to determine for itself. knowledge that might help to address, especially issues around adaptation and even mitigation, right, but around adaptation. And so one of the concerns is, okay, we will take that knowledge. Right? And so one of the impetuses that we're seeing is this idea that the, that the indigenous people should not be, they say, hoarding or seeking to hold that knowledge themselves. And, and that's a mischaracterization that's occurred. Right? People are saying, no, we just want to have a discussion and negotiation what the terms of that exchange will be, right? And the argument is from governments is, well, you are subunits of our national sovereignty, right? There are solutions that we need to provide, so we're going to provide those solutions even if it means sort of using your knowledge in ways that right, doesn't actually provide you with compensation or participation, access to beneficiary, or even have consent. Right? So that's one way in which it cuts against that. That so it's this weird recognition that there's a value, valuable knowledge in in the groups, but also then sort of this impetus to try and claim it for the broader sort of nation and community to, to begin to help. I would agree with you that self-determination, right, greater self-determination is a solution, and that comes out of two ways, right? One is local control generally, 
it, it's going to be a better solution for differentiated sort of habitat, change, habitat changes around that. Local solutions, right? Whether they are in the indigenous communities or not, local solutions are probably better in many ways for addressing adaptation challenges. But there are significant coordination problems in responding to climate change which require right, national responses or, or, or state-level responses. And again, I think there, it's a function of facilitating coordination, the basic premise of, sort of ensuring that people actually get to participate, are consulted, and can act. I am, I'm, again, absent a construct where we recognize right, some construct of ownership and I, and I say this really broadly, right? Ownership in the sense of we recognize that you are the holder slash owner slash beneficiary and that you will be sharing. Then it's really just a discussion for me about what the terms of the sharing will be and who is going to get the most of the benefit and is it going to involve privatization by others rather than the indigenous groups of that knowledge and that information. And if we can address those issues, I think, then, yeah, we have, we have a good solution. Yes. Yeah. But as far as like the copyright of myths is concerned, is that like, would there ever be a point where they enter public domain, or? So, uh, this is very interesting because I did a lot of work with um, public, uh, public access groups and, and groups that were really interested in, in um, sort of open access in the early days. And the idea that we provide protection for traditional knowledge and folklore, stuff that was considered to be common heritage of mankind, common heritage of mankind or public domain, was really problematic for them, right? Electronic Frontier Foundation, Center for Democracy and Technology, right? Um, Electronic Information for Libraries, all these groups who have been working on copyright limitation exceptions and better access, the idea that you had this constituent of people who not only wanted protection for knowledge, but for some parts of this knowledge, perpetual, non-time limited protection for the knowledge. And so the argument that I had with them, and the argument I think I continue to have, but I think I win, right, is that there's not a public domain. <coughs> there are public domains. And those domains exist at the national level, right? They are a function of national policy that generates what falls out of copyright, one out of one end in terms of t differentiating in time, but they also function what falls into copyright because of what you decide to set as your originality criteria, right? What you decide to set as, right, your fair use both, right? And so, my argument is, this is a natural law, right? This is policy. And so if you're going to argue that stuff should be in the public domain, you have to say, for which public? For the American public? Or for the Cherokee public? Right? right? Whose public domain should it be in? Right? Because we're talking about national sovereign determination. And so I said, that's your first question. If you can ask me that question, then we can have a discussion at the appropriate policy level about what should be in the public domain, what should not be in the public domain. But a discussion in gen of a generic public domain, I think, was a failure of understanding about how public domains get generated, what the polity is that determines right, what gets protected, what gets not protected. And so, I'd be banging, I, I will beat this drum over and over again. I think it comes down to the policy determination of the sovereign about what the nature and the extent of protection needs to be, and then we can have a discussion about length of protection, term of protection, etc. Now, at the international level, right, where we actually are coming to try to find some agreement, right, about what the level of protection should be, right, there is an argument being made, well, what should be the extent of the protection then? Right? For how long? And there I think you can have a valid argument about, okay, for some of the things, we will make a bargain. For some piece of knowledge, we will agree to some limited term of 
protections. But other pieces of kinds of knowledge, we will not agree to that, right? And on our own territory, we will still be able to maintain unlimited protection, right? That, those are things that are up for negotiation, but not as a function of sort of rights or the greater good, but as a function of a bargain around the sovereignty and each state, make each sovereign's assessment of what is the good, right, for its own population. I want to go back to the topic of um, international negotiations and get your sense of the likelihood of a successful conclusion to the negotiations going on right now at WIPO. And um, assuming that those are concluded, uh, prospects for successful implementation in, um, well, especially the United States, but I'd also be interested about your um, impressions on implementation in South Africa or, or Canada. So. The WIPO division on traditional knowledge, genetic resources, and traditional cultural expressions did a really smart thing um, when they realized, I think in 2009, 2008, 2009, that they kind of hit a wall, a conceptual and a, and a, and a, and a, and a negotiating wall, which was they were not going to be able to get the Australian government at the time, or the US government at the time, or the Canadian government at the time, to move the process forward. So what they did was, they decided to create facts on the ground. And so what you had since then is the proliferation of national systems of protection for traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. Brazil, Peru, Colombia, right? Bolivia, um, Argentina. In, um, in Africa, you had a, uh, a movement of the African Union, but also the TK Bill in South Africa. Uh, Right, we had um, OAPI begin to uh, provide a, an additional, uh, the Bangui, I think Bangui, right? Um, right? And so, one of the things I think, by dodging your question a little bit, is that I think we're going to get there by the back door, by sort of this real proliferation of national systems that is going to put pressure on, right? firms and actors in the US and Canada and, 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 and Australia to say, oh, okay, we can't go in here anymore, or we're having to engage with so many different things, okay, now we need an international instrument. So the, the kind of pressure that happens generally in copyright and other places where <coughs> you get different forms of protection, lack of harmonization in different places, you end up with pressure to come to the national agreement. But what that means for me is that I don't see that occurring for another five to ten years, that the pressure has built up enough that you're in a place where private actors and maybe public actors in the core countries that are resisting it will get to the point where the government will say, okay, we need to come to the negotiating table and come with a, a solution that begins to harmonize this because it's getting in the way of us doing business. Right? I think it's the same way that the Europeans have begun to sort of get so many countries that adopt geographic indications that I think the U.S. is beginning to feel a little surrounded around the issue of geographic indications because they have trouble ex they're going to have trouble exporting some of the products that they would like to export to other countries. Right? I think in much the same way. What's happened this week, which is whether or not to continue the mandate and to continue negotiating on a text that is on the table at the moment, the U.S. is actually causing a significant amount of trouble. They want to take a significant step back, and they may not allow consensus to be reached on the new mandate. And so if that occurs, we may end up with another two or three year hiatus in the WIPO IGC on the discussion of this. Um, the Trump administration have been deeply unfriendly to this issue, and so whereas at least on the Obama administration, they, could, they pretended that they were reasonable and interested in negotiating. The Trump administration has no interest in such pretense. So I suspect we're in, we're, we're in for another two or three year hiatus in the negotiations. But I'm not pessimistic. I actually think we're going to get there, just not the way we originally thought we were. <coughs> One question then. Yeah, two points, please. Uh, First one is, uh, what kind of risk 
I agree that it's very easy strategy to try to, to use international law for protection, but what kind of risks have these this is strategy, you know, for example, in Colombia, in the 90s, we import the multiculturalism policy to try to solve the cultural conflicts or for a larger degree. <coughs> After 20 years, we recognize that uh, this policy has created cultural heritage. You know? um, and the second one is about, uh, if not clear for me, the conflict with the community. Because the meaning is so different, you know? uh, for the law is one meaning about traditional knowledge, but in the community the people is the life itself. You know? So, and for example, in, in Colombia, in some um, systems from the Greek laws, that some lawyers and politics and some social leaders have tried to to do the same way, to try to use the law for protecting, you know? uh, but it has created big tensions, you know, because, you know, um, some colonized communities uh, have fear, you know, fear about any foreign thing, you know? yeah. So how, how was this process to, to create consensus with the community, and, okay, this law is so I think you're right. This is not an easy problem because, of course, we talk about indigenous communities as if they are easily recognizable, workable units of governance, right? And, of course, they are not. Um, on the other hand, and I think this is what I like to stress, this is not a problem that is unique <coughs> to indigenous communities. Right? This is a problem that is unique to countries. Right? Countries have this exact same problem. Right? Like Mozambique, Angola, right? borders around Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, Somalia, right? Bangladesh, Myanmar. Right? The issue is not the existence of the sovereign, right? The issue is always going to be that there are going to be disputes around where the borders of the sovereign are. Right? And so what is our system for managing those conflicts? So at the international level, we have some version of the UN system for both mediation, for recognition, whatever that entails, and there's a bunch of international law around that. that we have, right, United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, right, which really focuses on these ideas around consent, participation, and what that tells us is whatever happens with each community and how they self-determine and self-organize, we hope, right, without a full top-down recognition by the metropolitan state or by the international community, the baseline law which every community every nation has to comply with in how they operate is human rights law, right? That to the extent that the Universal Declaration on Human Rights applies, it applies to not just sovereigns, but sub-sovereigns and sub-localities, right? That those people have human rights obligations themselves, civil and political rights obligations, but also right, economic, cultural, and social rights as well. And so if we focus in from, a, from that rights-based perspective and think about, okay, community formation in that context, community democracy in that context, right? Community participation, community consultation in that context, that's what we use to assess the rightness, the wrongness, the success, the efficiency, or the failure of community formation processes, <coughs> rights formation processes, right? Where people try to determine by saying the federal level should determine and recognize the tribes without using that as a basis, then I think you end up with a real conflict, right? The, the Colombian government says, okay, no, you are the representative, no, you are the representative, right? And picks and chooses who are the representatives. 
that creates a real problem, creates conflict within the groups, co-opting co -opting particular people for particular purposes, right? But if you do so from sort of a rights-based perspective, I think you address a big chunk of that problem. No, this is not a solution, right? That, that for everything, it just says that that's a procedural way to approach it that begins to talk about it equality of treatment, rather than saying that they are particular human rights problems that are peculiar to these communities, and therefore they cannot be allowed to determine for themselves what to do because they have governance weaknesses or cultural weaknesses around that. There's one last question, and then we need to... Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so that we can vacate the room on time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, join me in expressing our profound thanks. Um,